This morning's reading is taken from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. It can be found on page 1174 of the Church Bibles. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth, plant it deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So as you've gathered, if you're a visitor, or as you remember, if you've been here for the last couple of weeks, we have been making our way through the book of Ephesians, and we're now on the third chunk of that. And it might be useful to just have a very quick refresher that in chapter 1, Paul has already talked about the idea that God's blessings are like this fountain of grace that just keeps coming. You can't turn the tap off. We've looked at the idea that hope for the future is one of the key things that Christians have And we looked at God's power to bring all things together under Christ, which is a magnificent vision for where the world is going. And all of that is about God, and it's absolutely shot through with praise. That's been the whole tone of what Paul has said so far. And a key point comes at chapter 1, verse 17, and you might like to have these things open for yourself on page 1174, which we're coming to in a moment. Uh, Chapter 1, verse 17 Uh, where Paul is praying that the people he's writing to will see more clearly just what they have in Christ and that they will know God better. So that's where we've been so far. But now at chapter 2, verse 1, Paul writes, as for you, uh, or more literally just in the original Greek, and you. And this is really, I think, a continuation of the prayer that Paul has already been praying I want you to know God better, but now I want you to know yourselves better too. I don't know about you, but I think lots of us are quite scared at the thought of self-knowledge. Um, uh, we're a bit afraid about what we might discover <laughs> if we know too much about ourselves. Uh, I, and in the age of Photoshop and Instagram, everything is about image, um, covering over what might be lying inside. I don't know if you're familiar with the, uh, the novel by Oscar Wilde, the, the picture of Dorian Gray. It, it, it has been dramatized. It's quite, it's quite a dramatic story, but it hinges on the idea of this extremely good-looking young man who somehow manages to arrange by some, <laughs> some spooky thing that there is a painting of himself, um, and he will never age, and he can be as dissolute as he likes, but the painting will show what he really looks like. Uh, And it ends with this harrowing moment where he cannot bear the burden of living this lie and slashes the painting and and a a, a decrepit old man falls on the floor. It's almost impossible to bear the burden of the lie of discovering what you're like 
if you have deliberately lived that sort of life, says Oscar Wilde. Jesus said to the ruling classes of his time, who were very keen uh, to put forward the right image, the truth will make you free. The truth will make you free. In other words, the less you feel the need to whitewash yourself, the more open you are to actually learning to be like Jesus, which is what a disciple is about. So self-knowledge is where Paul is taking us here. And Are, are you up for this? <laughs> Do you mind a bit of mirror stuff here? There's a lot in this particular passage, and I don't intend to go through it absolutely verse by verse. But I think there's a key in recognizing that where it starts, if you'll have a look at verse 1 and verse 2, it starts with an old pattern of life. This is how you used to live. Um, The the word that Paul uses in the literal Greek is, 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 uh, is the same as what we use in the word peripatetic. This is where you used to walk. There's a way in which there's a pathway you used to follow. But by the time we get to the end in verse 10, uh, there's a new pattern of life. This is how God now wants you to live. This is a new way of walking. That's how you walked then. This is how you walk now. See what the journey is in between. And the shape of the passage is a bit like what Paul was doing in chapter 1, which is taking us up to a very high viewpoint and looking down on things from God's point of view. And it's as if he's saying, look, right down there, do you see that very dark valley with a dark cloud hanging over it. That's where you used to be. That's not where you are now. Um, But look somewhere much higher up on the mountain. Um, There is a place full of bright sunshine. That's where you are now. That's the shape of the passage. It's about where you were and where you now live. And so what I'd like us to do is to look at three things. One is the dark cloud. One is what God has done to take us out of that. And the third thing, which is the thing to rejoice in, where Paul's making for all awake, all along, is, is the new place where God has placed us. So if we can have a picture of a dark cloud, please. Yeah, that works. Um, Paul is saying, look at the way that you used to live, as he writes to these people in Ephesus. And the summary of it is there in verse 2. You used to live following the ways of the world. So let's have that as a caption, just a sort of reminder of where we start from here. Oh, that comes up too. That's good. Um, we need to adjust something there, don't we? That all needs to be slid, slid slightly to the left there. When Paul is talking about the world, he's talking about human society, and he picks, 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 uh, picks, paints quite a devastating picture of it here. But I'd like to pick out two particular things about human society that he's bringing our attention to. The first is chafing at the idea of authority. Or putting it more simply, we all have inside us that thing that says, nobody's going to tell me what to do. I don't know whether I don't know how many funerals you've been to. In the nature of things, when you've got a dog collar, you tend to have been to rather more of them. But it's surprising how many people want played as a piece of music as a funeral. Frank Sinatra singing, "I did it my way." Um, that just that sort of last defiant gesture. I did it my way. Nobody tells me what to do here. And says Paul, whether we realise it or not, when we say those sorts of things, we are following Satan's lead. That's verse two again. The Bible pictures Satan as a sort of proud spirit who abuses authority. God has given him authority, but it's been abused. And whenever we see upsurges of unrest and violence in society, um, we might even say something like, there's something in the air, isn't there? And Paul's picture of it is is that Satan, who is described here as the ruler of the kingdom of the air, um, if there's unrest, he's there busy pouring oil on the flames. There may be something at the heart of what the unrest is about which needs to be addressed, but Satan's very keen to pour the oil on the flames. If you like, Satan is the inventor of anarchy. So that's the first thing. This is human beings chafing at the whole idea of authority. But the second thing that Paul wants to add is that we are at the mercy of our desires. Have a look at verse 3 there. Desire's not a bad thing in itself, um, but it needs to be properly channeled. So desire to eat is what keeps you alive. Desire to eat far too much may take you to an early grave. It's a matter of channeling things. And it's the same whatever it is that you really want, the desire. And I think a flashpoint comes when you can't have it. I want it. I can't have it. And the way that Paul describes this here is literally that we are children of wrath. 
Uh, I don't actually agree with the way the, 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 new, the NIV is translated. This is objects of wrath. That's not what Paul says. It says we are children of wrath. And just as he said earlier on, you are sons of disobedience to describe what it's like being disobedient in our very nature. I think what he's saying here is that you're children of wrath. Being angry is part of our very nature as well. It's exactly the same sort of phrase. Uh, I think there's a man on the front row that can correct me if I'm right here, but this is, this is a Hebrew way of speaking is to take a, a particular quality and see you as, as being like the family of that. You're the offspring of disobedience or of wrath. Children of wrath, um, and this is in a week where we've heard all sorts of stuff about the Jeremy Kyle show. Um, a sad example, I think, about damage done by people who are in the grip of anger and, and publicly parading that for people's amusements. Um, Bitter words, broken relationships, physical violence. Uh, I think some of the things I cringe most about as I look back on my own life are things I did while I was in the grip of anger. So human beings chafe at the idea of authority. Uh, We're at the mercy of our desires, but but that's not all. Um, Verse 1, each wrong or shabby action, says St. Paul, deadens us spiritually. We were dead in our sins. I wonder whether you can remember the first time you cut a corner, morally speaking. Um, you did something that you knew was wrong, um, perhaps as a child for the first time. Oh, I, I'll do that. And you may have been quite shocked at what that did you, to you to have done it, but you then had the decision, will I ever do this again? And if you did, and it went on and became a habit, it became increasingly easy to do it because you become deadened to it. None of this is saying that there is nothing good in the world or that every person is is as bad as they can possibly be. But it is, I think, a plea for self-awareness. Recognize what there is in you. And death is not just the moment when you stop breathing. It's a power that's at work in us all the time, every time we do something wrong. And I'm touched by this, and we all are, says St. Paul. So, so there's our picture, human beings living under a dark cloud, and that was your pattern of life, says Paul, as he writes to the Ephesians. But, but the point is not to get lost in gloom. You know, I, the sort of situation comedies where you, you, you get some demented figure that's going around trying, whoa, whoa, whoa. Paul is not interested to labor the point so much as to just be realistic about that. Um, it's to make a contrast. As for you, verse 1, but God... In verse 4, you, tarred by disobedience and anger, but God, rich in mercy and full of love. It's that contrast he wants us to explore. So let's now have a look at what he says about what God has done to make a way out. And the key thing here is to get hold of the idea of grace at work. Grace is one of the first words that Paul has used in the letter to the Ephesians, and he uses it three times more, perhaps you notice, as we went through the reading there. So we need to think about it, that everything that makes it possible to leave the dark valley is God's free gift. Costs us absolutely nothing. And it comes just out of the love of God. And more than that, the power of grace is greater than the power of death. So let's have the word grace up there as a reminder to us that grace is so much more powerful If you read the Gospels, you can see what it's like for the full force of death, the power of death, to be thrown at Jesus. Angry people, egged on by Satan, saying, no one tells us what to do, crucify, crucify, crucify. And, says Paul here, think what God did then. God brought him back to life, raised him up, and has seated us, and has seated him in the heavenly places. Uh, That's an enthronement picture of Jesus now ruling the world. But the amazing thing in verse 6 is that it's suggesting that as God did that with Christ, he did it thinking, this is not just for my son. This is for everyone who will ever give allegiance to him. They will have new life. They will be lifted up. They will have authority. And there's this wonderful upward movement uh, that We will be in the Messiah Jesus in God's mind all along. So now, if there's a dark valley, there's a lifeline out of it. Uh, 
And I, I wanted to find some sort of picture which would capture this. For I hope you think I've got it right here, but can we have the next picture? Uh, I like the idea of a sort of cable that's been put in that takes you from the bottom place right up to the top place there. All illustrations have their limitations, and you can explain to me afterwards why this doesn't work in some respects. But what I want you to see is that salvation is God coming to the rescue in the face of all the forces that pull human beings down. Uh, There's something constantly working to pull us upwards there. Think about some simple act of service that you have received from somebody else recently. You can probably think of something in particular. On a grander scale... Think of the desire that went into something like founding Tear Fund, an organization that cares for the poor. Each of those are an example of the power of Jesus' resurrection at work, overcoming the forces in the dark valley. And there's something more as well, that Paul is really at pains to say that this is all God's initiative. I wonder whether you noticed that. It's what, verse 4, it's what God did when we were dead in transgressions. Dead people don't take initiatives. Um, Verses 8 and 9, it's by grace, not by works. Or putting it a different way, you didn't sweat your way up that mountain. Um, You didn't install the cable. It was all what God did for you. You just stepped into the cable car, which is a simple act of trust. You are saved by grace, but through faith. Why stress that particular point? I mean, it's something that Paul says in a number of his writings, but why at that point here? Well, he tells us in verse 9, it's so that no one can boast. He wants us to understand that you've not been lifted up so you can then look down upon other people. Isn't self-righteousness a corrosive thing? The, The look on somebody's face that says, I think there's a bad smell under my nose. The, um, the cataloging of other people's mistakes. You know, I've got a list of what you're doing wrong here, and I'm looking down on you as I do so. There is no place for that anywhere in the world, but particularly amongst the church. And the antidote, what do we do about that? It's verse 10. It's saying, I am God's workmanship, constantly reflecting on the fact that whatever good there is in me, it is by the grace of God. Whatever good there is in me is by the grace of God because I am his workmanship. And I want you to accept the idea this morning that there is good in you because I think some of us have a job with that. I wonder whether you underestimate what God has already done in shaping you, how much God has already been doing. When other people see good in you and they comment on it, accept it. Don't don't just shrug it aside. They're seeing kinds of God at work in you. If you have any doubts, reassure yourself this morning that you are a precious child of God, guided by a loving Heavenly Father, and you are that in Christ Jesus. When you put your faith in Jesus, that is simply true, and Paul wants you to know that about yourself. So we've now come to where Paul has been making for all along, which which is at the end of verse 10. We are created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Or put it in another way, God has not saved us just so that we can enjoy the view. This is why I was a bit doubtful about the cable car illustration here. I mean, the, the, the people that are standing there must be a very old one. Like you can actually stand up and look at the view in this, in this old cable car. But that's not the point. Uh, did you notice in the news this week that, uh, that Doris Day has died at, what, the age of 97 or something? Now, those of you that are here a fortnight ago are, are, are going to sort of think, you know, another senior moment here. For the second time, this man is talking about elderly female singers, but there we are. The, the important thing that I wanted to point out is that her most famous song is Ki Sera, Sera, Whatever Will Be, Will Be. Um, and that's just what this is not about. <laughs> just sort of, oh, let's just go along with it. God's doing everything. We can trickle along and let him do it. It's something much more active than that. It's because we're living in a new place that we should be following God's way. So this is our, our last sort of summary caption here to, to get captured, if we can have the last thing up there. It's that contrast between following God's way rather than the ways of the world. God sets out the pathway, says Paul, and, and we work, walk in it. 
And there's a wonderful balance of those two things together. It's not all God and it's not all us. It's the two working together. I think that's rather exciting, that, isn't it? That God sees each day as a set of chances for you to be a blessing to other people. I wonder whether you start your day thinking that rather than just, oh, another day. (laughs) Opportunities to be the hands and feet of Jesus to other people. He's finished his previous chapter talking about being the body of Christ. So think about it. A, A kind word? Some careful preparation for what's coming up? A deliberate journey that you take? A prayer that somebody else will be healed? Setting an example for somebody else, perhaps without even realizing that that's what you're doing. So much impact that you can have for good. And this is what God has always had in mind for you. Becoming what you were made to be in Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul's going to spend the rest of Ephesians talking about. And we've got a lot more to unpack here. But I'd like you to hold that thought in mind. Let's have a prayer as we just sit with that thought and that you're going to be made in the image of Christ to be what he always intended you to be. This is a prayer of George Appleton. So should we just sit quietly for a moment and and, uh, I'll say this prayer for us. Give me a candle of the Spirit, O God, as I go down into the deeps of my being. Show me the hidden things, the creatures of my dreams, the storehouse of forgotten memories and hurts. Take me down to the spring of my life and tell me my nature and my name. Give me freedom to grow so that I may become that self, the seed of which you planted in me at my making, and which is fulfilled in Christ. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Amen.